Okay, good evening and welcome back to our, I'm not sure what number now, I've lost count of the discussions about the greatest Negro League players of all time. Tonight we are talking about, first of all, we're talking about the first baseman. Um, tonight, as ever, always, I have my three fantastic panel of experts to discuss and to go through each player and discuss their merits. Um, and then, of course, you, the viewer, can, at the end of this, um, vote on which player you'd like to see joining the Dream Team canvas that's coming on behind me. Um, if I can just pass over to my panel, uh, just to give a quick introduction, and let's start tonight with Jim. Hi, I'm Jim Obermeyer. Uh, I've written some books on the Negro Leagues, uh, primarily about owners, F.A. Manley of the Newark Eagles, and Cumberland Posey of the Homestead Grays, and a team history on the Atlantic City Backrack Giants. I've been a Sabre member since 1985, and a member of the Negro Leagues Committee uh, since not very long after that, since I discovered it after that, and uh, worked on a lot of projects with a lot of people about a lot of ballplayers over that time. Thank you, Jim. Okay, Ted. Okay, I was hoping I wasn't going second. But oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're in. Uh, I'm not an author. I mean, I consider myself a Negro League buff, but I, I did want to say three things. And I, now I'm, I, okay, I am a published author. So who am I kidding? I've written three coloring books for kids on the Negro Leagues. Oh, wow. And uh, oh. one article for the Sabre Journal and, and one Sabre biography. So I guess I'm, I'm young enough to have a future as a writer. <laughs> Very good. And last but not least, Leslie. Uh, hi, I'm Leslie Heapy, a history professor at Kent State University at Stark. Uh, I've written on the Negro Leagues and women's baseball. I'm a Sabre member since 1988. Um, vice president of Sabre. Very good. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you very much, all three of you, for being here and giving up your time for this. So tonight we're starting with discussing first base. And our first three players are Buck Leonard, Mule Suttles. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Suttles. And Ben Taylor. So let's start with Buck Leonard. Um, elected the Hall of Fame in 1972, born September the 8th, 1907. And he died in 1997. Um, as with many of these first basemen, I noticed the slugging percentages was pretty good. Um, what should we note about Mr. Leonard? Leslie, he's your favorite player. Go ahead. Next no. one. Uh, next Mule's one. Your favorite. Mule oh, the is, next one. The next yeah, one. it's the okay. next one. Right. <laughs> well, okay. Mr. Mr. Leonard has one, I mean, he's outstanding in so many ways. He has one amazing, uh, for, for a Negro Leaguer, he has one amazing uh, thing going for him. He only played for one team in the Negro Leagues. He was 26 years old when he started to play professional baseball. He worked in a railroad yard in, in or near Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, where he grew up. And he was, 1933, he was laid off during the Depression. And he'd been a, he was a good local ball player, so he started to play semi-pro ball. And as happens, he would play his kind of way north. He'd play for a team. He went to Baltimore and played. And then he wound up with the Brooklyn Royal Giants, who, who back in the day, the day being the teens and the 20s, were a first-class team. Now, now, at this point, the name is attached to as kind of a local New York area semi-pro team. And, but he's playing for them. And... Mm -hmm. Buck was not a party guy or anything, but he, I guess he did like a drink now and again. But one night he finds himself in a bar in Harlem and the bartender is the proprietor, uh, a guy named Joe Williams, who we will come to in a night or two. Uh, Williams had been one of the best Negro League pitchers. He's now retired. He's running a bar in Harlem. He knows, he knows all about the baseball scene in New York. And he says to Leonard, you know, you're pretty good. Words to this effect. Uh, you're pretty good. You could uh, you could play in the Negro Leagues. Oh, you think so? Yeah, let me give my friend Composey a call. Well, Posey owns the Homestead Grays, who were a significant, although not the consistent 
championship team they later became, but, but a significant team at that time. So Posey says, sure, send them down to spring training, which is in, not in Florida, unfortunately, in Wheeling, West Virginia, or someplace where there's still snow on the ground. And so he goes down and Posey says, well, look, you can hang around. And, you know, I might be able to use you. I've got a deal with a guy named Jim West from Indiana who's going to come and be my first baseman. Well, West never showed. West took a, took a different deal. So Leonard gets chucked in there in 1934. And when the Grays finally went out of business in 1950, he's still playing first base. And the only significant portion of a season he ever missed was about half a year when he got a broken wrist or hand when he was hit by a pitch, which could happen to anybody. The seamheads.com, which we have agreed in past meetings is the, the go-to place for Negro League stats, uh, normalize the stats over 162 game season. So you can sort of compare them to mainstream major league production. Bucks a 343 hitter with a 1.026 uh, on, uh, on base plus slugging. He averaged 26 homers, 38 doubles, 147 RBIs a year. I mean, this is, and this is consistent. This is his, his decline play phase. You know, you're supposed to have, you're supposed to go up and then go down as you get older, but he's still hitting 300 at age 38 or so. He didn't really have much of a decline play uh, phase. He played in 11, uh, the, the um, Negro League All-Star Game was called the East-West All-Star Game, played in Comiskey Park in Chicago every year. Buck played in 11 of those games, hit 326, three homers and 13 RBIs in 11 games. And as off, is often the case in those All-Star Games, uh, you, you know, often the players don't play the whole game because you've got a lot of All-Stars, you've got to shovel in the lineup, so... He just was remarkable all, all around. He played for the Grays when they won nine straight Negro National League pennants and a couple of Negro World Series. He's, uh, well, he's my favorite, my favorite first baseman anyway. Mm. <laughs> so that's Buck. He's, he's also named by Sporting News number seven on their list of their um, top 100 players. So he's in that top 50. He was a finalist for Major League Baseball's All Century team. So recognition on, on that side of things. Um, Eddie Gottlieb, one of the many agents, and said he was as smooth a first baseman as he had ever seen. Great glove, all of those kind of things. So everything that, that Jim said and more with the recognition. I also find it interesting that in addition to working in the railroad yards, he spent a lot of time as a youngster working as a shoe shine. Uh, and that was how he uh, made uh, helped his family out and things like that because his dad died in the Spanish influenza mm. in 1919. And so uh, sort of connecting it to today. Mm -hmm. um, but from everything you read, he's also sometimes referred to as the Black Lou Gehrig. Yeah, and on that point, let's look at the 162 game statistics for Gehrig and for Buck. Buck hits 343, Gehrig hits 340. That's a fair comparison. Gehrig hits a few more homers, I think 37, where Buck is at 26. But on the RBI count, Gehrig has 149 and Buck has 147. Mm -hmm. So statistically, there's a, there's a very fair comparison. The, the being with one team, Gehrig also is just with the, uh, with the Yankees. So I, I, I see a lot of merit in that, that comparison. I also wanted to mention one other thing. We've already covered a few rankings. Uh, in 1999, the Negro League Committee was polled, Jim and Leslie, and I don't know, I think 60 other people, if I recall correctly. Uh, the number one player uh, ahead of Page, ahead of Charleston, ahead of Gibson, uh, was, was Buck Leonard. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's another feather in, in his cap. The, the fact that he was with the Homestead Grays for just most of his career, or well, in fact, all of his career, sorry, I'm assuming that is pretty rare. Like That doesn't seem to be the case with many of the players, he's, I see. He's the only one of any of a, of a significant player who played his entire career with one team. Yeah. Of course, he, he had the advantage of playing for a team that never went bankrupt. 
<laughs> a lot of players change teams when their when their teams sure. hit the dust or the leagues folded, particularly during the depression. But, uh, but they were the, the Grays, best. Story. By the time Leonard joined the Grays, they were always making money and all of that. But I think I I I, I read his biography, uh, Leonard's biography, in the process of writing the biography, my biography of Posey. Seems to have been very happy there, mm. very satisfied. Mm. Team played well on a lot of pennant winners, on a lot of a lot of all-star teams. Uh, I don't I don't get the impression that he was ever really uh, seduced away by any other owner, and he was happy to stay and play for the Grays. Excellent, excellent. All right, okay. Thank you very much. Let's let's move on to our second, who is uh, Mule Suttles. Um, born in 1901, dying in 19, uh, 1966, and elected into the Hall of Fame in 2006. And Leslie, this is your your is this your favorite <laughs> player in the Negro? Yeah, absolutely. In the, in the yeah. whole of the Negro leagues, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so Suttles, of course, from Alabama, real small town. That there was great debate initially over exactly where he was born, but eventually settled on. Started out playing left field, but ended up primarily as a first baseman, but did uh, play a little bit of left field. Uh, 22 years um, with variety of teams, um, most generally remembered for playing for the Eagles um, in a latter part, but also played for the Giants, Chicago American Giants, Birmingham Black Barons, the St. Louis Stars. Um, he's credited with five East-West All-Star games, and we've talked about sometimes people's getting elected and then their performance in the in the all-star game and this is where mule i think for me partly stands out he hits the very first home run ever in an east-west all-star game in 1933 1934 he had three hits in his and then in, in 1935 he walked four times and then hit a three-run homer in the 11th inning off uh dehigo to win uh, that particular so in his first three that was his performance in the um all-star game he comes out as a 317 hitter uh, with the 162 game uh, normalization. He described by everybody sort of as the gentle giant. Uh, somebody, one player, one of his teammates described him as ever smiling and that they never saw him any other way. He was very popular with his teammates. Um, popular with the fans as well. You read lots of accounts in some of the newspapers of him um, going out and giving um, home run hitting demonstrations, essentially, because that was what he was known for, the, the long ball. Um, and lots of apocryphal stories about how far he hit the ball and hitting it 500, you know, and, and those are hard things to, but that's the kind of stories that fall. In fact, that's where he got his nickname, right? The kick mule kick from the um, idea. Played um, certainly down in, in Cuba as well. Um, played in the California Winter League in the 30s and is credited um, with 64 homers and 126 games while he was playing out in California oh um, yeah. over that time period. Um, his, uh, he was not the, the best fielder, but he was not an awful fielder. And the, this, in fact, some of the stories that you used to hear made it sound like he was worse. And then now you look at his actual stats and it's, he's not as, uh, he, was a, he was a competent uh, first baseman. Um, and so that sort of, uh, but he, he just seemed to be the, the kind of player that everybody liked. He was not a gregarious. He hit cleanup um, most of the time when he played. And so that's a little bit about Mule Suttles. Oh, often some of the things that later to get the, some of the difficulty in crediting some things to him later, he was often referred to early on in the newspapers as Settles or Settler instead of Suttles. And so trying to figure out some of that, which often happens, but in his case, a um, couple different, very close, but not actually, and figuring out that that was him mm. was always interesting. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Let me start with uh, Leslie fact-checked uh, Suttles' autobiography for Saber. So, you know, she's, she's the expert on this topic. Uh, Suttles, his, uh, one of his, comps to the uh, Gary Ruth or Leonard Gibson pairing would be Willie Wells. Mm. Uh, they were together for, I think, 14 years, both Hall of Famers, both infielders of that great infield in, in Newark. Uh, another point of interest is the size of his bat. Uh, there are some people who say he, he used a 37-inch 
56 ounce bat. Now that, that's a, a source which I, I've never found, but Hillerich and Bradsby, which makes the bats, say he was a consistent 36 inch, 36 ounce, ounce bat user. So uh, he, he wielded a big stick. Mm. I forgot to say just so the Louisville Slugger Museum um, keeps all the has all the bats from players that they and they only have two Negro League related bats in their entire and one of them is mules. Um, and so they actually do have and I actually have a picture of myself wow. hitting with his wow. bat. Cool. <laughs> um, so I can attest to it's it's, it's uh, the other one that they credit to the new, even though it wasn't a Negro League bat is Jackie Robinson. But they have mules. They have mules bat. Wow. Very cool. Very cool. Jim, anything to add about Mr. Mule? Well, his uh, his normalized stats, 338 batting average, 1022. His stats look a lot like Leonard's, except he's normalized 162 game home run production is 31, which you can, might, might imagine, 156 RBIs. Uh, he, he played basically, his, he played for several teams, but basically uh, St. Louis Stars from the mid 20s to 1931 when they went out of business and this is the depression put an end to the first Negro League. He then ended in Chicago with Chicago American Giants for about four years and then well I'm a little biased because I wrote a book on the Eagles but then he moves to the Newark Eagles where he's around for almost 10 years, eight, eight seasons I think as the first baseman, as Leslie said, he played a little outfield, but he's primarily the first baseman. And um, he's part of that million dollar infield of the Eagles in the late 30s, three of whom, Dandridge and Wells and Suttles, are in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. He had a he had a great career. He he was a was a guy you could always, I would say you could always count on to hit. <laughs> and he did. Okay, thank you very much. That's that's fascinating. Let's move on to our last of the first base candidates, who is Ben Taylor, uh, elected into the Hall of Fame 2006, born uh, 1888 and dying in 1953. Um, I've got here, he's, he was known as Old Reliable. And uh, again, I guess this is looking at his stats, I can see there's a pretty consistent flow there. Um, what, what should we point out about Mr. Taylor? Oh, he was very reliable. <laughs> <laughs> well, he comes from he comes from one of the premier baseball families. He had he was one of four brothers, all who all of whom who played Negro League baseball. Three of them for years and years. The one brother who didn't, Charles C. I. Taylor, um, who was uh, manager and owner of the Indianapolis ABCs and died uh, at a fairly early age, you know, taken, taken away from the sport while he, he as a manager and owner was still pretty much in his prime. Had a brother named Jim Taylor, who also played, uh, now Ben has got, I don't know, what's Ben got for 21, yeah, 21, 21 years thereabouts. Uh, Jim, Jim Taylor probably played, I'm sure he played and managed that long. Johnny Taylor, their brother was a pitcher and he was, I forget the years, he was around for a long time. So it's a pretty amazing family. Um, Taylor was a more of a line drive hitter, not a, not a, the only one of our first basemen here who wasn't a home run guy, particularly, but he had a lifetime batting average of 332 and an OPS plus of 139. He was regarded as a very good fielder. Um, he, he played for a lot of teams. He managed uh, for he managed for nine seasons. Although a lot of the teams he managed were pretty bad, but I don't having written about a couple of them. I don't think that's necessarily his fault. <laughs> he just was hired to run bad teams. Um, but he was uh, he was something of a disciplinarian. One one thing I do like about him is when he got to the Baltimore Black Sox, who were kind of uh, torn apart by um, bad behavior and, and a poor conditioning and everything else. One of the first things he did was ship out one of his best players 
John Beckwith, who is one of the best, who is one of the best on the field performers and one of the worst off the field uh, uh, personalities in ever in Negro League Baseball. And Ben Taylor took one look around and got rid of him. I believe he sent him to Harrisburg. How did that work out? <laughs> Worked out pretty good there. We liked Well, him. except when he punched the umpire off the field and got <laughs> suspended. That didn't work out so well. But no. anyway, you get my point about that. But anyway, Taylor, uh, uh, Taylor, he was reliable. He was respectable. He was a well over 300 hitter. And he played for a long, long time. You re- if you really look at the, all of the first basemen, I mean, who, who had long careers. These three guys um, just rise up above all the others for for reasons of how they performed on the field and reasons of personality and longevity and basically being good people to manage. So that's... Well, and that's interestingly, it. Buck Leonard said about about Ben Taylor that he learned everything that he basically knew about playing first base from... Uh, ben Taylor. So there's your connection between. Oh, um, that's, ben yeah, that's right. Yeah. Ben so, Taylor was one of those managers in, in Leonard's first 1933 year. I believe he was with that semi-pro team in Baltimore before. Mm-hmm. He went on. Yeah, yeah. There was a connection. So, there, right? Buck said that that's where he learned. Um, he was described yeah. as being one of the keenest minds in baseball. Um, that he truly knew knew the game. Um, in addition to the old reliable referred to as a true gentleman by more than one. Um, and as Ted often has pointed out in some of our earlier, I don't, he hit, he played a good portion of his career during what we would think of as the dead ball era. So when you think about his lack of power, that certainly contributes to some, but he, that wasn't his, he, he was known for hitting to all fields. Um, and that, hence part of his nickname as old reliable was, was that aspect of him. And I just want to underline what Jim said about these three being the three first basemen. They rank one, two, three in war among first basemen. There's a Pedrozo in that list also, but he got most of his war as a pitcher. So these are the three highest ranking first basemen by war. Right. Sounds like a good, a good lineup for everyone to think about. All right. Well, thank you very much for that, guys. That is our uh, discussion for the first baseman. Um, Buck Leonard, Mule Suttles and Ben Taylor. Please make sure you vote after watching this for whoever you think uh, deserves to go onto the canvas. Thanks very much. And we'll take a quick break and then come back for our next video, which is about the catcher. Thank you. <laughs>